Welcome to the Masters of Engineering podcast. We take a look at cool products, the people who develop them, and how we do it. I'm John Hershtick. I've spent my life building software for computer design, but the coolest part of my job is getting to meet some of the coolest people involved in product development on the planet. And in this podcast, you get to meet them too. Now, all my guests are special, but today is a really special guest. All right. Well, with us today is Byron Block. Now, Byron is an internationally recognized consultant in the field of auto safety design and crashworthiness. Byron has been doing this, believe it or not, for over 50 years, which means he's one of the most experienced people you're ever going to meet at doing anything. And another really cool thing is that he is my uncle. And Byron is the person who persuaded me to pursue a career for product development and mechanical engineering. And for that uh, is one of the, one of the many reasons um, that I am uh, deeply grateful to him in my life. And really all of you should be deeply grateful to him for the impact he's made on the safety of our world. So Byron, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, John. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here with you. Well, um, I'm so glad to have you here. Um, it's really special to me. Uh, let me ask you uh, about auto safety. You've been doing this for 50 years. How did you get started? Well, uh, going back to my teenage years in Chicago, where I was born and raised, I've always had a, a, you know, a, a liking, uh, a passion, let's say, uh, for cars. It, it, like when the new cars would come out, I would go to the dealerships. I would then do sketches of the new cars and then show the sketches to my classmates uh, before the cars even officially, you know, came out to the public. So I always liked cars and uh, learning from uh, my family, especially, uh, for example, my dad is a pharmacist, uh, the compassion to help others. Uh, as a pharmacist, I would go with him when he would deliver prescription drugs to the elderly and the people who could not get out um, and get them on their own. So um, I saw that it was just a good thing to try to help other people. And with my love for cars, I blended then this uh, element of, of being compassionate to help other people uh, with my love for automobiles and uh, my interest in design and uh, blended it all together. And also, as I learned, um, that when people get horribly injured or killed in a crash, um, the victim is called the plaintiff in a lawsuit against the car company. And uh, they need an auto safety expert to help tell a jury uh, what was unsafe, needlessly unsafe about the car at issue and how it could and should have been made safer. So from actually going all around the country incessantly for many years, inspecting real accident cars, um, I would try to help them, the individual uh, car crash victims in their pursuit of justice and compensation for their injuries. But then I didn't stop there. I took that information and used that to fight for safer cars, so whether it was fuel tank safety or stronger roofs and rollover accidents. Uh, better side impact protection, the need for airbags, et cetera. What are the major areas of auto safety um, that you've seen that we've made progress on in your career? And what are the ones that right now you think are most important for the future to make progress on? Okay. Um, historically, going back, a lot of people watching or listening to this podcast might remember there was a time when a common rear impact collision that the car that was struck in the rear uh, would burst into flames and the fire would engulf the vehicle and its occupants. And uh, every year in America, uh, we would typically have about 700 or so people literally who would burn to death in their car because the car was struck in the rear and the gas tanks were located right near the rear bumper. Now, from a design standpoint, John, uh, as I examined multiple cars, Ford Mustangs and the Chevy Vegas and, uh, you know, just so many brands, uh, it was common to have the gas tank located very near the rear bumper, which also was a contradiction because the rear of the vehicle is designed 
uh, purposefully to crush up. It's called uh -huh. the rear crush zone. So why on earth would you put the gas tank in the rearmost part of the vehicle? And so uh, to use a very sophisticated technical or engineering term, it was a stupid design. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so I fought uh, for many years to try to convince the yeah. industry to move the darn fuel tank. And I did a crash test to prove this. I redesigned a Ford sedan and put the fuel tank system forward of the rear axle, crash tested it yeah. at 63 miles an hour, uh, causing you know similar damage uh, to what happened in a real world accident. And uh, this is a severe rear impact. And then turning the vehicle onto its side, uh, what you would see uh, is that the fuel tank system that I had redesigned survived very nicely. So I used this to help convince the auto industry to move the fuel tank. And John, uh, I have to say, with many things in vehicle safety, it took the industry 20 to 30 years wow. to finally get the message and put it into practice. What are some of the other key aspects of, of safety that we've done that you've seen improve in your time? Okay, uh, then there are many uh, rollover accidents that occur annually. And even though rollover accidents are typically around only um, 4% or so of the totality of uh, vehicle accidents, over 20% of the fatalities occur in the rollover accidents. Wow. And that's because for many, many decades, the roof structures of too many vehicles, and I'm talking about cars, SUVs, minivans, pickup trucks, were so weak that the roof would buckle and crush down in the rollover accident. Any other key area you'd highlight yes. as a major improvement area? Yes, uh, an another area that's um, uh, gone through this similar kind of process from horrific to improved, uh, but still some ways to go is, it's a subject called truck underride. And that's when a passenger vehicle, a car, a minivan, a pickup truck crashes into the rear or side of a large truck or tractor trailer and continues underneath uh, the rear or side of the trailer, which then causes penetration into where the driver and passengers are. And on many of the cases I've worked on, I'm sad to say that uh, the people uh, were decapitated, literally decapitated uh, when their vehicle went under the rear or side uh, of, of the large truck or trailer. Uh, well, I had to try to put a stop to this travesty and so um, I was invited to testify at a U.S. congressional hearing, John, in December of 1991. And at that hearing, I showed crash test footage and case examples to show the members of Congress that we could and should have stronger rear guards on our trucks and trailers, but also a need to have side guards. I'm embarrassed for our country and for the truck manufacturers and trailer manufacturers. We are now in the year 2022, and we still do not have the industry adopting side underride protection guards. Mm -hmm. They've adopted them in Europe since the uh, mid-1980s. And here you see me. I went to Europe. This is me back in 2001. And I'm kneeling next to a fairly robust side underride guard. And uh, now we're talking 21 years later, and we in the United States yeah, totally. pride ourselves on, on you know, doing that which is necessary to protect our citizens. Uh, we have not moved uh, an inch forward in any way uh, to require side underride guards on the trailers. And nothing has prevented the industry from moving ahead on their own. What about um, other areas of progress? Can what about airbags? That's uh, uh, that was a, a horrendous battle. And yeah. uh, uh, we had the capability of having airbags in all our cars since the early yeah. 70s. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I don't I know, know if you're going to mention it. Yeah, you know where I'm going. Because yeah, 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 please uh, tell the story. Uh, if you, well, I can, can I, may I? Yes, please. Okay. So in the 80s, when I was, um, I was a young adult, I, I was passing through Los Angeles and Byron and his family lived there at the time. And I had a, a layover, an unscheduled delay. I call from the airport, Byron, I'm in LA, maybe, you know, Uncle Byron, 
any chance we get together? He goes, where are you? I, I'm at the airport. He says, I'll be there in 20 minutes or whatever. And you pull up at the curb in a, I believe it was a 1973 93. Chevrolet Impala, which at the time I'm talking about, was the car was already 12, 13 years old. And it had factory airbags. Yes. Is that right? Yes. And the license plate was airbags. With a Z at the end. Yeah, with a Z. And <laughs> so the point, though, being I'm, I'm making a little light of a very serious subject. You're saying that airbags were around and, and you owned a factory GM vehicle from the 70s that had airbags in it, right? And yeah. so, so what? So, so you, you were involved in getting airbags to become standard in vehicles, right? Yes. Um, I fought uh, for many, many years, going back to uh, the late, you won't believe this, the late 1960s on some mm. TV shows. Uh, I was doing sketches <laughs> and showing some early crash test footage of cars equipped with uh, then experimental airbags and saying we need to have these in all our cars as soon as possible. Then you get into the early 70s and GM produced this fleet of 1,000 1973 Chevy Impala airbag sedans uh and uh no surprise i still have one you still have it yes i'll you take still it own that. Ride. <laughs> oh yeah wow and, so you, uh, you've owned that car a long time yeah, yeah and i actually have had two of them and i would use it at different hearings in california and at the federal level at uh, the national highway traffic safety administration to say hey not only can we do it with airbags i've got the proof here is a mass produced Chevy with full front seat airbags and uh, for the driver and both front passengers on the big bench seat. Oh, and both uh, of them, all three yes, across. Three across, in the three across yeah. right on the bench seat. Yeah. And the passenger airbag was multi-inflation pressures, low pressure and high pressure, which uh, helped alleviate uh, a high pressure inflation that could injure children in lower speed crashes, especially. So it was a very intelligent design. It uh, was promoted by GM as aerospace technology and ready to go. And then the industry's leaders went to the White House and convinced President Nixon at the time to cancel the then pending requirement for airbags. The common yeah. theme here is all of these changes took too long, but eventually happened. So yes. there's, there's bad news and there's good news. And the good news today is we all benefit from yes, airbags in our cars today. And that's, you know, that's a fantastic story. What other things do you think are coming up that will, will be that our future selves will say those were the, the, the great transitions. Well, in auto safety? You know, we've all heard the expression back to the future. Yeah. Okay. Well, we need to go back to the future uh, and make major improvements in visibility or the driver mm -hmm. to see pedestrians uh, uh, in front, uh, to the side and to the rear, as well as other vehicles on the road. Mm -hmm. But what's happened is styling has become uh, so predominant that, uh, for example, if you look at the latest pickup trucks and even mm -hmm. SUVs, they have enormously tall, wide, <laughs> and you know, uh, let's call it aggressive front structures and so you, they can't even see if there's, uh, for example, uh, uh, some children could be crossing in front of a current pickup truck or SUV. Uh, and you wouldn't and even see them. Yeah, You wouldn't even see them. And many yeah. parents, and this is very sad to say, parents in backing out of the driveway have actually killed their own children who were oh playing God. in the driveway. Uh, and it, it's a tragedy that, again, the current and recent vintage vehicles, and then moving forward into the future, uh, they have to pay much more attention to the driver's ability to see 360 around the vehicle mm -hmm. so that they don't knock mm -hmm. over pedestrians and don't run over uh, either backing up or going forward. They don't run over children, uh, you know, who might be playing in the driveway. You yeah, know, yeah. Near but, but back up, we're, we're, we have cameras. I mean, I drive an SUV, as you know. Yeah. I drive, I'm one of those big SUV drivers. <laughs> but the, the camera in back would seem to me to be a tremendous safety aid for children in general. Yes. Do you agree? Are those cameras helping? Yeah. Okay. The cameras are definitely yeah. helping. But again, mm -hmm. um, uh, the vehicle designers do not yeah. currently have a mandate to maximize the driver's 
vision ability. See, so it's unregulated as to what can be seen. And you're right, the bigger I, I totally get it. In fact, I find myself turning on my camera. I, I my car has a front camera as well, but it's not normally on. When I pull out of a parking garage, it's going up very steeply combined with the high roof. I can't see the sidewalk in front yeah. of me. I turn on the camera actually and take a look just to be be sure. But I get it. And so that's one area. What else is another is area? And, and this will you'll identify with because uh, when Naomi and I came up to Boston, you were kind enough to attend the session about the uh, how to uh, have more efficient vehicles in terms of less weight. And if you have mm -hmm. less weight, then you need less of a, an engine and less fuel consumption yeah. to propel it. And so you attended and you saw my presentation uh, yeah. on, on that. I call it the obesity of vehicles. And uh, we're going in the wrong direction currently, uh, uh, you know, internationally and uh, by U.S. automakers, uh, because now they're making vehicles that are much too large and much too heavy. And as mm -hmm. a result, the fuel consumption has to proportionally, you know, be more excessive than if we had a lighter weight, more fuel efficient uh, vehicles. And what we have lost sight of is uh, the car has become almost like a god in our society hmm. where uh, people, uh, you know, their success in life is measured about, uh, you know, what's the biggest, heaviest, you know, most expensive vehicle that they could uh, flaunt uh, out there, you know, in their neighborhood or to their uh, colleagues. And instead, it should be what is the most fuel efficient and the lightest weight vehicle that will well, still protect you. So what's your thought on electric vehicles, which which um, obviously don't use fuel, they use energy. And, you know, what do you think about electric vehicles? How is that impacting it in, in uh, weight and safety? Well, electric safety? vehicles uh, are on a good trajectory, but again, uh, they're losing sight of, again, the uh, other principles of lighter weight, better packaging of the passengers, the driver and passengers, uh, and maximizing mm -hmm. the safety. What's your advice today? Someone looking for a new car, what should they look for to get this safety wise? Well, I, I think, uh, again, it depends on the family size and the needs okay. and so on. Obviously, those are uh, criteria. But yeah. I, I think uh, they could find out uh, a couple metrics. Uh, one would be the strength to weight ratio. And it should right. be at least four to one. The crush strength. Yeah. When you say crush strength, strength, you mean the crush, rollover. Yeah, crush strength. because that is an indication as to whether the manufacturer really cares about you. Okay. And if they don't care about you, it'll be, you know, uh, three to one, 3.2 to one. Okay. If they do care about you, it'll be 5.3, 5.6 to one. Yep. And then also the, uh, uh, the airbag technology, you do need side curtain and side bolster airbags because um, you need that protection, obviously, mm -hmm. in the side impact situations. What can we do to be better drivers? Say we've got the safest car. What would be the number of one, two, three things we could be doing? Okay. Uh, I would say a principle that's overlooked in our me first society is courtesy. So that means don't make sudden moves to cut them off so you could get ahead and, uh, you know, get home three seconds earlier or two minutes earlier. Don't be in a rush and uh, also uh, pay attention to your total surroundings. So if you come up to a stoplight, for example, at night and uh, you want to make a quick right turn because that way you can get home, you know, 20 seconds yeah. earlier, there may be a pedestrian about to step off into the crosswalk. And if you're in that much of a hurry, uh, you're not going to see the pedestrian. And we are seeing in the United States, we're seeing uh, quite an increase in pedestrian fatalities uh, in those kind of situations. Let me go back. I want to go back to a couple other interesting chapters in your background. We could talk about auto safety all day, of course. But um, going back to college, you actually studied under Henry Dreyfus. Is that right? Yes. Can you tell the audience who he is and why and and why that was cool? Henry Dreyfus is one of the three fathers of industrial design in the United States. Uh, the other two would be Walter Darwin Teague and Raymond Lowy. Dreyfus was chairman of the industrial design department at UCLA when I went there in the late 1950s and early 1960s. 
Uh, I went to his studios and his home in Pasadena. He would have the members of the classes come out to see his offices. And he, he was a wonderful man. And so I'm sitting in a lecture hall and in a classroom at UCLA in like 1959-ish. And there's Henry Dreyfus pointing out, whatever you design, safety is one of the foremost principles that you must keep in mind. That's great. What a great. So you can imagine its lesson. influence on me moving forward from oh, UCLA. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is like having Thomas Jefferson telling yeah. you what the principles should be for formulating and running your country henceforth. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's along those lines. It's really amazing that you were there because, you know, and and then I also, you touched earlier, you mentioned TV shows and no interview with you would be complete without <laughs> you talking about your TV career. Can you tell us a couple things about when you, you were earlier in your career, you did some really interesting things with television. And um, can, you, can you tell us about that? Uh, I realized that the public is at risk on the roads and they're not getting the information they need. So I wrote a letter to ABC News in Los Angeles. Long story, uh, to boil it down, they ended up hiring me to present twice a week on KABC TV, Channel 7, Eyewitness News in Los Angeles, yeah. a big car market. Um, I was presenting my own auto safety reports twice a week on the news. So they would say on Channel 7, Eyewitness News, uh, you know, this is your number one channel for news, weather, sports, and auto safety information. And uh, I would come on and present a, a three-minute report uh, twice a week on auto safety. And John, in seven years, twice a week doing this, I never ran out of material. And, and uh, uh, well, LA was a car, it, it was and is a car crazy town, yeah. right? And, and then I brought some of this, the uh, topics I brought to the network. And then uh, ended up uh, being then interviewed rather than presenting it myself. I was then interviewed on um, 2020 and primetime live. And I did uh, beyond the Pinto about the fuel tank fire hazards yeah. to alert the nation uh, about uh, also the Volkswagen Beetle ejector seat because too many vehicle seats were too weak. Oh, I remember that when I was yeah. a kid. You did this whole series on seats and, and neck and whiplash cases yes. and the head supports and so yes. forth. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. And then uh, also after Princess Diana uh, perished in that unfortunate Terrible. tragedy in Paris, uh, I, I was on... Uh, uh, also a program called Primetime Live on ABC. I remember seeing you then, and yeah. I didn't even know you were going to be on. This is the thing Byron's been on TV so often. I've actually been watching shows not knowing you'd be on, and then on comes Uncle Byron talking about um, Princess Diana's death and that tra tragic and accident. it could have been prevented. Yeah. My point yeah. on the show I remember. I remember. If there was a guardrail in the tunnel, as yeah. there should have been, then her Mercedes that she was in and the rear seat passenger, uh, her Mercedes would have been safely deflected off of and away from otherwise being a you know frontal severe right, right. killer. Yeah, and she I would remember. have survived. I remember you said in the United, this is an example where the United States had the regulations in the United States, you could not have had a situation that would have caused it. There would have been a crash, but probably not a fatal one, right, is your point. Right. Right? And so Sam yeah. Donaldson, who interviewed me, uh, uh, Sam and I took a drive, and I pointed out guardrails in various uh, analogous tunnel situations in the Washington, D.C. area. So a lot of television. I want to end on a couple couple things. One is story, one question. I'll just tell the story I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast. My personal story, and one of the many ways you were influential in my personal life, is when I was... Um, I enrolled in college at MIT, and I had been programming computers prior to college in high school. I, I learned to program computers, and I thought I wanted to major in computer science. And Byron, I still remember, was in the kitchen of our apartment in Chicago. He pulled out the course catalog and showed me the classes I'd take in computer science, like compiler design and things like that. And he said, you don't want to take these classes. Look over here. And he flipped to another section, the mechanical engineering department. And you showed me the classes in product design. And you said, these would be really great. And I read those descriptions and I thought, wow, that does sound cool. And that really, it, until that moment, I'd never thought of majoring in, in mechanical engineering or pursuing product design. If you hadn't done that, 
I don't think I'd be sitting here now having spent in my life, believe it or not, over 40 years of my life building CAD software, building many systems, including today Onshape at PTC, but prior to that SolidWorks, which you know I'm gratified many people have used over the years. And I worked on many other CAD systems. But anyway, all that came from that redirection of me from being a general computer scientist into learning about product development. So for that, I am very grateful to you. Um, last question maybe about touching. We talked about your time in auto safety. Safety in general, a lot of our audience designs products that are around people or that people use. Do you have any quick thoughts for people to, to live, how they could follow the Dreyfus principle of safety? Can you give them any thoughts or ideas that might change their thinking about safety in other domains of product design? Sure, John. Thank you. And uh, and by the way, I'm glad, I, I'm I'm proud that in a small way I helped influence your ex astonishing, wonderful career. Well, it's um, it's kind yeah. of say that, but and, and uh, um, I would say uh, I I would leave with uh, two two thoughts. One is whatever product you're designing, before you commit it to final prototype and pre-production, and then obviously into production. Before you do that, consider all of the ways that the product might fail, might malfunction, it might cause needless injury, and try to design out the, the basis for your projection. Oh my gosh, uh, this, if it malfunctions this way, it could kill 10 people or, uh, mm -hmm. or 5,000 people. So what I'm saying is uh, in, in current vernacular, uh, sometimes you hear it expressed as a failure modes and effects analysis, but you don't even need that kind of jargon. I'm just uh -huh. saying, try to brainstorm and foresee how the product through its normal use and even misuse can cause harm to other people and then design it out. Don't just leave in the hazard and say, oh, we'll put a little warning label in the owner's manual or we'll put a little sticker at the bottom of it or something design it out. And I would also say it would be great if there were algorithms uh, in some of the design software that would sort of foresee the misuse and the dangers and the malfunctions of various products, whether they be automobiles or not, and sort of warn the designer, hey, this is a less safe design than need be. And, you know, you need to redesign. Could you imagine if the software was available in the 60s and 70s and the algorithm said you don't put the gas tank next well, to the bumper? If you, yeah. if you don't understand what I'm saying. So yeah. so if you could have an algorithm that is, uh, or multiple algorithms that are safety based, the principles of safety and design, um, that could help uh, as well. Well, a small step in that direction is making more and more analysis tools um, simulation tools available to product designers at the point of design. And we're working on that at Onshape and others are, but I think those tools have to, the others have built them and that's not anything like that. We, we don't have the ability to understand a gas tank placement, but we do have the ability to give an engineer more insight into the strength, say the structural strength of a, of, of a design earlier when, when it's the most important part we're going to continue to put analysis closer and closer to the point of design than ever before. I have to say, unfortunately, it's probably time to time to wrap up, but Byron, thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us today and sharing your 50-year perspective view on auto safety and into the future and beyond. I thank you on behalf of me and all of us for the impact you have made on the safety of the cars we drive and the lives that are of people that are here on earth because because of uh, safer vehicles. I want everyone to know you can learn more about Byron at autosafetyexpert.com. That's autosafetyexpert.com. If you're interested in other episodes of Masters of Engineering, you can listen at Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts for listening. And you can watch in video on YouTube. Um, I love hearing what you think. So make sure you leave a review of this episode. Tell me what you thought of Byron and his stories. And you can follow me on Twitter at Jay Hirschtick, J-H-I-R-S-C-H. 
T-I-C-K. That's it for today. See you next time on Masters of Engineering.